Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Sean Brewster, Boating Lennon here with you once again. Bo, today's topic is placebo. This is likely to uh, potentially ruffle some feathers, but also maybe pique some interest with a few different people because placebo is one of those things that's often talked about, possibly gets a bit of a bad rap um, and possibly gets misrepresented a lot of the time. Let's talk about placebo. Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, we've got to look at the difference between placebo and the placebo effect. Because placebo is sort of, uh, I guess, an approach or an intervention that should have no therapeutic effect. And it's useful for uh, measuring the effectiveness of interventions. Um, but the placebo effect is the belief or the perception that there will be a therapeutic outcome. And so that's really interesting when we talk about pain and pain as a perception as we, as we speak about quite a lot. Uh, and so can there be a placebo effect with different interventions that lead to a reduction in a person's pain? Absolutely. That's nice to differentiate the two. Uh, this is a, a subject we often talk about in our courses and about the, the various different factors that can lead somebody to get a beneficial or therapeutic effect that aren't always directly associated with the thing you're doing. Sometimes it's the thing that you're doing and the patient's beliefs around that, but a lot of the time it's the trust the rapport, the contextual factors, the environment you've created, the story you've told, all of these other things that play into the patient feeling better or perceiving changes that are happening in their body. Yeah, that's right. And that's the it can be a bit of a trap when you link that to cause and effect. Yeah. I did this treatment, which means that must have been the cause, which is why I got the result. Uh, and, you know, that's not often, uh, it's, well, it's not always the, the case. I mean, it's very easy to link cause and effect. And, and just to give you an ex a, a bit of a funny example is I, I did the whole ice bath thing the other week and someone said, oh, I hope I don't get sick after this ice bath because last time it made me sick. So that cause and effect, easy to link those relationships, but we know that cold doesn't make you sick, right? right. Yeah, that's right. You, it's just because something uh, coexists doesn't mean that it correlates. You know that those thing, two things don't have to be connected together. And and uh, yeah, this, this is a, a very easy to trap to trap to fall into clinically. Somebody could come in and have a massage and walk out feeling sick afterwards. Well, was it the massage that somehow released the toxins that we always love talking about, or was it that they're actually developing some kind of virus or flu or something before they got there? And then it just happened to happen afterwards. And so this is the, like you said, it's a, it's a trap and it's a very easy one to fall into, I think, a lot of the time. Yeah. And like, there's a number of different reasons as to why someone gets better. And, and that could be things like regression to the mean. It could be the natural history. It could be that there's, um, I guess, other treatments that, that are going on at the same time, or it could be just coincidence. And, you know, if you take a sample of people with uh, knee pain, for example, um, over six week period, and you retest those same people with, with uh, knee pain, well, there's a very good chance that not all of them will still have knee pain. And you see this all the time in back pain, any pain throughout the body. All right. And so is it because you provided a very specific treatment, you rubbed things in a certain way and and maybe rubbed some crystals or did a, a, sing, a song and dance around it and that was the reason for it getting better or did it just get better? All right. And so it's very difficult to then say, well, it's specifically because of this treatment and having a very elitist approach to a certain treatment protocol or um, a very specific way of doing things. Well, there's numerous different factors that are in involved in that. And one of those could be the placebo effect. Definitely. And look, another sort of example would be a patient comes to you with any degree of pain, and we know that there's various psychological factors that will influence the the degree that the to, to the the degree to which the person will experience the pain. So if they're let's just say one day their pains are three out of ten, the next day their pains are seven or eight out of ten. Well, what's changed to the next day? Could it be that there's other stress related factors going on in their life? Maybe they're a little bit sleep deprived, or maybe there's some pressure at home. Something that can all all these things can heighten the person's pain experience. And then they come and see a practitioner like us. We provide a calm nurturing, safe environment where they can be heard, where they can offload some of the, the stress 
uh, or thoughts that are going through their mind and they can feel like they are being cared for and listened to, then it would make sense that when they leave our clinic space that they might feel a little less of that pain because of some of those other contextual, emotional, psychological factors that might be contributing to their pain experience. Because we know pain is not purely a physiological experience. There's a, a psychological, emotional overlay that connects with that, that to amplify it. And so if we are dealing with some of that by simply being a good set of ears, by creating an environment where they feel safe and heard, then it would make sense that they could walk away feeling better, regardless of what we've physically or actually done for them in the clinical setting. If we've just been there to listen, and made them feel safe and heard, that itself can be a huge reducer of, pain, re reducer of pain. And this is where I think a lot of practitioners fall into the into the, the pitfall of believing that they are the Messiah, you know, the, the person who's provided the miracle cure, that they can, they're the person that will solve all of these issues. Listener, maybe they are just good at making people feel safe and comfortable. And that in itself, is still a therapeutic intervention. I, I believe that's still a really valuable thing, which is why placebo, the idea of plac the placebo effect gets a bit of a bad rap because it's a powerful tool when employed and utilized effectively. What we can't do that, that is saying what we're doing with our hands and our tools is providing all of the outcomes because there's so much more to it than that. Yeah, that, that's a good point because, you know, some people feel a little bit let down that, or, you know, I guess people think, well, what am I really doing here? Well, it's maybe it's not so much about what you're doing, but those other factors, as you just mentioned, it can be very important. Uh, you know, it's not really our job to heal people, but we can coach people along the way. A lot of condition, musculoskeletal conditions are self-limiting. All right, so if we can provide people with a reduction in, in pain short term, we can provide them with confidence and, and optimism and a bit of a plan to go forward. Fantastic. We're helping them along the way. It's not really up to us to, to uh, I guess, heal the body. The body will do that by itself, given the right environment and, you know, uh, using us as a, as a coach to remove some potential contributors or help to educate the person about that. And so that whole therapeutic effect, the therapeutic alliance, making someone feel comfortable and, and safe in their body, um, you know, that can be pretty, pretty powerful. So there's a lot more to it than just a structural narrative behind what we're doing. Um, you know, because that can also lead to the opposite effects when we talk about the nocebic effects. If if it's very much embedded in that structural or biomedical view, then that could potentially have have a, a negative outcome. Hundred percent. And I think um, another way to frame this up too is like we we have expectations, right? When we go to see a health practitioner, if those expectations are amplified by recommendations or beliefs about that person, like for example, if both you had an injury to do with your neck. And I said, you need to go and see Tom down the road. Tom is the best practitioner I've ever seen for neck pain and neck injuries. Every time I've been to see him, he's resolved it quickly. Every person I've ever sent to him has been, has been helped by Tom. Tom's the man. You're going to walk in there with a certain degree of expectation. And that is only going to amplify any of the, the effects that, might, that he might achieve or she might achieve through that clinical intervention. Whereas if I said, I'll go and see... Uh, Tim down the road, Tim's pretty good, but he's pretty available most of the time. So you can usually get into seeing the expectations different. And so all these little contextual factors, all these little beliefs, these, uh, the, 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 um, yeah, that your mindset going into these exchanges is always going to impact these things. And so our, I think our job as health practitioners is to try to, where possible, amplify those things for the patient. So they come in expecting to get a good outcome. And then all we've got to do is be a good practitioner along the way. And we can multiply what we do through those expect expectations. Yeah, expectations are really important and previous experience. Again, you know, if someone's had a previously good experience with a certain modality, they will often link back to that, that with a heightened expectation of getting a, a really good experience again. And that's a placebo effect. All right. So uh, whereas if they've had a bad experience with a certain modality before, uh, they're, they're more likely to link a negative experience to that and they're less likely to get a good response from that. Um, so, for example, if someone says, oh, no, I've, I've had dry needling before, I really didn't like it, did not, uh, in, uh, did not get a good response, 
No worries. They're very unlikely to, to get a good response from that based on their expectations and their previous experience. And you could put that down to a number of different modalities. And, and so the whole contextual effects and the placebo effects are very important. They can influence our reward responses as far as uh, dopamine. It can influence analgesic responses as far as our endorphins. Um, you know, our expectations and, and our perceptions of pain, that can all be influenced areas in, in our brain, such as the, the prefrontal cortex that are important for higher order thinking and decision making and, um, you know, learning and memory that's associated with different areas in the brain as well. So pain is complex, uh, as we always say. Uh, and, and so different interventions and how they're perceived can influence that outcome. And, and I also add that, you know, it's not only uh, the patient's perception, but it's how much, how good an, of an intervention that we think it is. So our beliefs will influence how the patient uh, responds. And also our patients will often, uh, uh, I guess, uh, play up their response as well. Uh, it's a better way of putting that, but say they get a better response to please the therapist. Yep. All right. And so that's another effect. So when you, you look at the overall effects of placebo, either they, they got better, but it wasn't due to the intervention. They think they got better, but they didn't, or we think that they got better, but they didn't. Yeah, right. So there's different, there's different effects that, that can go into that. Um, and, you know, a lot of this also comes back to our biases and confirmation bias that this is what it what it means because I've seen it this many times um, and we'll choose to ignore other things and, and come up with reasons why that may be false as well. Exactly right. So let's, let's discuss this one again, or not but again, let's discuss this one for a moment, which is offsetting or balancing two things in our mind at the same time, which appear to be opposites. One being we want to be an evidence-informed, evidence-based practitioner that relies on the science, the research to tell us that when we do this thing, this happens and that's why we should do it. And then the idea that pain is contextual, pain is personalized and that there are other factors that aren't related to the clinical intervention, the, the pure clinical intervention that will influence the person's uh, recovery, behavior, sensation, pain, and so on. How do we hold both of those things in our mind at the same time and say, I'm an evidence-informed practitioner? Yeah, well, it's a good question because it would be unethical to say to someone that this is the best treatment for shoulder pain and this will work for you. You've just got to, you've got to um, receive this treatment twice a week for the next 12 weeks and you will get better. That would be very unethical. Um and so we've got to we've got to balance sort of uh, the the perception of the patient and being on board with with the the treatment intervention and and the proposed effects and education about all of this sort of stuff, but not mislead them to the to the point that saying that this is a cure or this will fix fix your pain, um, because again it can be influenced by numerous different factors. But you could educate someone about well, this is what the evidence suggests. This is what I think uh, it will it will do, and and this is the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve. And this is also based on my uh, professional experience. Um, what we're looking for to see is your responses over time and, and how that influences your, your pain. We can also use various different objective measures along the way to ensure that we are getting some, some progressions. Um, and along the way, I'm always here as someone that you can, uh, you know, ask questions or, uh, I guess we can, we can progress and work through, through this together. So that sort of, um, shared decision-making process, it is important, but yeah, I guess hanging your hat on the the uh, on a single intervention as as the intervention that will fix your pain is, um, uh, I guess, yeah, not not so well uh, evidenced or not not so well supported. I guess. Yeah, right. So it's it's a there's a potential danger there in leaning too heavily on the research because the research if we look at it all and there's a lot to look at for a particular into for a particular pathology or presentation we might say well the research points to this particular intervention being the most supported approach and then you say to the patient okay this thing suggests this type of treatment this type of exercise and then you take that to the patient and they say well i've had that before and i didn't like that 
in fact, I had a bad experience and that might be an individual personal experience or it might be something else. And then, so then you're stuck with, well, the research says this. And so you're not really leaning up on the human side, you're leaning on the research side. And there's a danger there, I think, because you're going too far, letting the pendulum swing too far one way and not the other. The other side of that, which is what you touched on, which is the human side of it, which if we join those two things together, we've kind of got our biopsychosocial model of what does the research tell us? What does what do I as a practitioner believe to be true through my experience and what do I believe will work? And then what does the patient want? And what, do, what are their perceptions? What are their beliefs around? And we join those three things together in a big Venn diagram. And in the middle is probably going to be the best outcome for the patient. But the tricky part, of course, is that you get two people with the same two knee pathologies. The bit in the middle could be different from one person to the next because of the human elements. The research may or may not change much in a, in a set period of time, but the human that is interacting with that will. And that's where I think a good clinician will bring in their own beliefs, their, their own perception about what's going on, and then really work with the patient to find what they believe will work for them, what they want, what they expect, and hopefully meet in the middle. Yeah, definitely. And it, it, that's the thing. Um, research is very important to inform what we do, but also when we look at the methodology in, in research and what they're they're defining as a successful outcome. And pain, again, is complex, but you could look at um, level of disability, uh, level of pain, their quality of life, a number of different factors. Um, whereas other types of intervention may measure on different factors or they might use different uh, methodology around how they got to that outcome. So, um, yeah, purely just looking at, at the research in isolation is is difficult. Um, and we know with a lot of manual interventions, it can be difficult to, to get well-designed RCTs with a good quality um, placebo intervention. So, um, you know, all of these these types of research um, studies will, will have a possibility for for bias, uh, a possibility for um, placebo effects as well. And so we've got to always factor that in. And, um, you know, it, it can be difficult to translate research into, into clinical practice, right? 100%. Yeah, well, it's in the design of a research project most of the time. Is it? A patient comes in, I've got headaches and I'm going to be a part of this headache study and they're going to do something to me and it's probably going to have an effect. So therefore, I'll probably feel a bit better they don't know if they're in the placebo group or not. And so how much of that placebo effect is playing out and how much of it is playing out when they're actually having the, in the intervention as part of the, that research. So there's, like you said, there's always potential for misleading outcomes in a research project. But if we don't look at it, if we don't consider the research, then we're all we're doing is we're basing it on our own personal biased experiences. And it's hard not to have some bias in our own personal experiences. So we still have to consider it. Yeah, and it, you know, just to give you an example of that, with um, the use of opioid drugs, you know, opioid drugs have been demonstrated to be no better than placebo uh, over, you know, for for neck pain and, and back pain, with also the placebo having lower risk of opioid addiction in at, at twelve month follow ups, and the same has been shown in um, in antidepressant medications using a placebo can influence. The, uh, a patient's mood uh, and decrease the antidepressant effects. Uh, so, you know, that's again going back to their expectation of a therapeutic uh, effect. And, you know, like different types of placebos that, that we know that a, a, uh, an injection will have a greater uh, uh, placebo effect than a tablet or taking two tablets will have a better placebo effect than taking one tablet or a surgery might have a better placebo effect than, a, than an injection or a tablet. Um, and so, you know, when, when people perceive their pain to be the worst, they might need or perceive that they need the, the greatest intervention or the, um, I guess, the most drastic intervention to, to solve their pain. Um, yeah. And, you know, it sort of brings me to a really great uh, book by Ian Harris, uh, surgery, the ultimate placebo, and looking at a lot of the, the placebo effects in, in, in surgery and a number of other interventions as well. Isn't it interesting how that plays out? You made a good point there about like 
I've got really bad pain. I need more pills. I need more injections to solve my really bad pain, right? And so, and I think a lot of practitioners fall into the trap from their side as well. They'll think more is better when more is not better, better is better. So we see examples of this all the time on social media with people doing things like cupping or dry needling where they've just covered the body in cups. And now if you believe that cupping is going to help you with your pain, with your disease, dysfunction, whatever problem you've got, well, then surely more cupping will help me more with my pain, disease, dysfunction or whatever. But it's just not true. <laughs> In fact, all manual therapies rely on a specific dosage to get an optimal outcome. Well, at least we believe so. So if somebody's coming with a particular problem, there's, uh, there's an ideal dosage of that treatment that would likely get you the best outcome for that patient. And so giving them more doesn't necessarily mean they get, they get a better outcome. And I think that's a, a real trap for health practitioners too. I don't know, again, we harp on about this in our courses. We always talk about dosage. What's the appropriate thing? And the, the answer to that is always, well, it depends. And it depends on the patient. What are they coming to us with? So it's not like when somebody has a pain that is X number of you know points out of 10, and then the pain is in these areas, and it's spread from this point that we say, this is, this is what you should do. It's what are the factors? Have they, has the patient been sick? Are they recovering from something? Is there high levels of stress, anxiety, other mood-related things going on in their life? Are they in a sensitized state? Have they had good outcomes or bad outcomes with this modality before? You weigh up all of those individual factors relating to the patient, and then that helps you figure out your dosage for treatment. And that's, that's a, a real clinical reasoning approach to patient care as opposed to you know, just using your, your treatment style, which is I like to do more of something to get better outcomes. And it's just, it's just a false idea. Yeah. And those false narratives about what it's proposing to achieve with the lack of any scientific evidence behind it. Um, you know, so got to be careful of that using very evidence-based approaches and understanding, well, this is what the evidence suggests about this. Um, and then understanding all the other factors that, that may be involved and not just saying that it is this specific intervention. Um, and, you know, some people will respond differently to all sorts of interventions. And some people will respond greater to placebo interventions than others. And that can come back to um, different factors like how optimistic they are or how pessimistic they are. And to give you an example, there's a study, um, look at a cold presser task. So putting the arm into, into uh, ice cold water for two minutes. And what they did was they measured people who were more optimistic versus more pessimistic. And they did, uh, they put this hand cream on uh, all the way up to their arm. And, and one group was told that, uh, up to their elbow, sorry. Uh, one group was told that this is an analgesic cream that will numb the experience. It will numb the pain of the cold presser task. Um, and then the other group was told that this is just a, a cleansing gel um, that we, we put on before the um, the cold presser task, but it's inert, it doesn't do anything. And so the people who were more optimistic got a better pain reduction effect from the uh, placebo analgesia with the cold presser task than those who were more pessimistic. So we can see that people will respond differently to different interventions and even placebo um, based on their attitudes and their beliefs about how much something will work. Well, it's, it's fraught with problems, right? This whole placebo thing, which, which is why I think a lot of the time, those of us in the manual therapy field, and I think any kind of allied health field or health field, when somebody says placebo effects, we, a lot of people would look at that and say, well, you know, if you're using placebo effects in your consultations and your treatments, then you're not really coming from a science-based approach to healthcare. But we see this play out in research, that, which makes it a somewhat reliable thing that you can lean on. We see it play out in people's, uh, the psychology of our patients and what the outcomes that they achieve clinically. And it's it's a real thing. It's, it's a real thing. But I think to look at it and to say, well, it's a placebo effect, so then it's no good to us. We can't really kind of rely on it at all. We can't sort of say that it's, that what we've done has worked. If we, if we, use a clinical intervention with the patient, regardless of the modality we, we choose to employ. And we do a good job of those other things, those contextual factors to make the patient feel safe, comfortable, listened to, cared for. And we get a result consistently. Well, then some of that might be due to the, the application we applied and some of that might be due to just who we are. We'll probably never know 
how much and what percentage is one and how much is the other. I think the more the research directs us, the better we get at telling which of our clinical interventions actually work and which don't. But the other bit, I think that's a skill set that every practitioner should focus on more and more. And I know that you and I talk about this a lot, you know, the more, the further we've gotten into our careers and, and in our clinical careers in particular, the less time we've spent on the doing and the more time we spend on the talking, the understanding, the explaining, the educating. And at least in my experience, and I think yours too, we get better results from that bit. Now, is all that placebo? Possibly some of it is, we don't know, but a lot of it's just about making that patient feel heard and cared for and giving them probably some ownership back, which is taking a bit of reliance off what we used to, what we used to see as most important, which was what we did with our hands and our tools and putting it back into the human body that's actually healing itself right in front of us. Yeah, exactly. Like, I guess that whole feeling of being disempowered that you're not lengthening tissue anymore. Well, that's okay. Um, you're doing far more than that. You know, you're focusing on, on the person. Uh, and when we look at the, the pain as a perception, we can influence someone's perception about the pain and even about their body. So much of what we should be doing is promoting confidence decreasing fear, anxiety, and, and worry, and getting people back doing things that they enjoy, uh, you know, and we can use manual interventions to, to help bridge that gap from passive through to active. Um, and so it may not need to be so much about causing these structural changes in the body, uh, rather than looking at the bigger picture and, and how we get the person back to doing the things that, that they enjoy doing the most. So putting the patient first rather than our own beliefs, our own biases, the things that we believe set us apart as a health practitioner. Like we go like, I'm, I'm amazing at this thing. I want to be known for this thing. Well, maybe that thing's not for the patient that you see on a Tuesday afternoon at four o'clock. Maybe that person needs something else. They need a different intervention that maybe you're not known for. So maybe you do that for them on that day. And then maybe they get a bit of result. Like it's the, the sooner we remove ourselves, the practitioner from the center of our decision-making matrix and put the patient in there, the faster I think we get better results. Yeah, often I have people come and see me that I've been told I can't do this, I shouldn't do that, I've got to stand like this or sit like that. And I go, well, how come? What do you what do you think's going on there? Why do you think that's the case? What if we do more of that instead of doing less of that? Let's see how you go with that. I reckon you've got this. Mm. All right, just giving them the confidence and, you know, doesn't really matter what we do, but you see there's some great clinicians out there who are just awesome hype men or, or women. You know, they're, they're just awesome at making people feel really good. Um, yeah. That's awesome. That's, that's sort of, that's a huge therapeutic effect, just showing people that it's okay. Sometimes patients just need a, a, our approval or someone's approval to say, you can do this. This will be okay. And, you know, that I think is is super important. And if that's a placebo effect, well, that's influencing their perception, that's influencing their beliefs, that can influence their emotions and their behaviour. Fantastic. That's evidence-based. 100%. Uh, look, I've got a great example of a, a physiotherapist here in Melbourne who I, I saw present once at a conference and he talked about how he's flipped his consultations and he uses manual therapy as a reward. So he's a manual therapist in the way that he works. But he has the patient come in and start with exercise, start with movement and tracking and assessing progress. And then if they're doing well, which he invariably finds an opportunity for them to do well in each consultation, he then turns around and says, excellent, you deserve some dry needling now. You've earned it or you've, you deserve a bit of massage. And he throws him on the table, finishes his consultation with something that feels good as a reward, as opposed to doing that to begin with and then going into these other things that the patient might not necessarily want as part of their consultation, he starts with that and then rewards them with, he's flipped it. And so, like you said, you find an opportunity for the patient to, to explore something different, to, to find su some success and some progress. And then you use the thing that would have been the, the excuse to get them there as the reward for getting there already. And I think that's another way of looking at it. And I thought that was pretty clever. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. But I think the whole idea of placebo is an important topic that everybody needs to consider. Hopefully we've, we've um, shared some different perspectives here for people to take away and think about. And also probably, or also hopefully, emphasize those things that they can do as a human for their patient uh, in, the, in the client consultation to, to expand on some of the effects that they might be achieving with their clinical interventions. Um, placebo is a, a powerful thing um, when employed properly. 
and, and patients are they are really the driving factor behind their results, not us. Yeah, definitely, I agree. Excellent. All right, we'll leave it there. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. See you next time.